sorry, everybody, uh, for being late. Uh, I guess we'll convene the meeting here. Uh, I don't know if we really need to do introductions. I imagine everybody knows everybody. <laughs> so, um, so the first order of business is to elect the chair uh, and the vice chair. Um, so, do you want to make the motion, Representative? Well, I would move um, uh, Paul Thiessen, um serve as the chair uh, of the LCPFP. Any discussion on that? Uh, Mr. Chair, just for, for history, it seems like this rotates a little bit, and I think uh, the Senate was the chair last year, I believe. That's correct, oh. Senator Senjo. Yes. And you're absolutely right. That's how we've done it traditionally. So thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? That motion prevails. Uh, Representative Murphy, uh, do you have a motion for a vice chair? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would move um, Majority Leader Bach as the vice chair. Uh, any discussion on that? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? That motion prevails. Uh, thank you. So, um, uh, Mr. Marks and Mr. Nauman. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Eric Nauman. I'm the lead fiscal analyst with the Senate. Um, we're here to present some of the initial documentation that you have in front of you. Um, I'm going to be making some reference to a legal size document that got a bunch of numbers on the front and some small numbers uh, below. These are uh, a representation of some of the historical trends of budget solutions. Um, over over the past 10 or plus years. Both the House and Senate have independently been working on this project. Uh, we understand that the Department of Management and Budget has also done um, a little bit of work on this relative to the governor's presentation a few weeks back. We provided the House represent, uh, analysis as a representative sample of the method for examining the question of how past budget solutions have historically been solved. As with many questions of this type, there are a variety of ways that this question can be answered. And before we examine the enclosed analysis, and I turn it over to Mr. Marks, we would like to offer a few caveats for you to consider as you wrestle with this historical question. All analyses, House, Senate, and uh, the executive branch begin with the same starting point. Uh, the forecasted budget balance from the February forecast preceding the biennium during the odd numbered session years and the current biennium's budget balance during an even-numbered session year. The analysis then categorizes how the budget was addressed during the year using a series of what we would call broad buckets. Um, there is one exception to this rule in, in 2009, and we'll discuss that in a few moments. For an odd-numbered session when a deficit, also I should say, for an odd-numbered session when a deficit was project, projected for the current biennium, the enclosed analysis also displ displays those negative balances for those years. And examples, if you want to follow along, would be 2003, 2005, and 2009. Um, because, and, and those exceptions are because we can't end a, a fiscal year with a negative balance, so we're displaying those solutions for you as well. On those occasions when a positive balance was projected during an odd numbered session for the current biennium, that positive balance was projected, uh, was, was counted as part of the beginning balance for the subsequent biennium. It's worth noting, though, because of the automatic buyback statute where we add money to the reserves um, and uh, shifts when, when those are not at statutory levels, um, we, we, there was no positive balance because it's projected to be zero by definition. Unlike most budget analysis that we talk about here in the legislature, this analysis uses projected budget balances uh, across time. So we're examining each session and the, the budget balance um, that occurred at, at that time, and they're portrayed in actual dollars. There has been no attempt to normalize the deficits or surpluses um, for inflation or any other, other representation. It's just the actual dollars that were projected at the time. So in an attempt to categorize these trends uh, of the solutions over the past 10 or so years, uh, I mentioned earlier that we've collected them into a, a broad array of buckets. The analysis groups the solutions into 
non-tax revenues, tax revenues, cuts, shifts, transfers, and reserves, essentially columns three through seven and column nine. However, because there's some unique circumstances of certain budgets, column eight adds the federal era funds. These are the surplus dollars from the federal government. Column 10 adds appropriation bonds from a few years back. Uh, column 11 includes other bonding, and column 12 includes gubernatorial and allotments. And just one thing I'd add here, while, while we've, we're grouping these things into a whole variety of categories here, uh, from the fund balance perspective, from when, when MMB does their accounting of this, everything is either spending or revenue, and everything's either a spending reduction or a spending increase or the same, or it's a revenue increase or a revenue reduction. So, so there, to, to, to broaden these categories, we're pulling things out of one of those areas and putting them into other areas. Uh, and just as an example, transfers, for example, which we've ca categorized separately here, are typically a revenue item. It's a transfer from another fund to the general fund. That's increased revenue in the general fund. So. So we're going from this perspective that everything's either a spending issue or a revenue issue to grouping them in a lot more categories. So that's, that's why it leaves room for interpretation in, in a number of cases. And so moving into that interpretation, there are certain circumstances over the past 10 years that can confuse the analysis of the trends. Not surprisingly, we're talking numbers and these, are, these are, can be open for interpretation. And we thought maybe a brief discussion of some of those individual circumstances might help you contextualize the issues as you wrestle with them. So the first, first example would be the federal era stimulus money in 2009. Um, it could be counted as revenue or as general fund spending reductions. The federal government provided additional funding for Minnesota and most states in its, uh, it, it, um, at that time. Minnesota chose to reduce its higher education, HHS, uh, corrections E-12 aid appropriations at that time. Um, this helped balance the budget by reducing our overall spending, but you could count it as increased revenue from the federal government so that you can interpret that. As, it's, it's a matter of interpretation. And another good example of a matter of interpretation that is incumbent upon the, in the analysis, it relates to, the, relates to shifts. The analysis separates the E-12 education shifts, shifts out as a separate category However, if they weren't categorized in that way, they could also be counted as cuts to education spending. This is, again, a matter of interpretation. Also, the analysis includes $220 million of June accelerated sales tax in the 2003 shift numbers. This accelerated payment is also a shift, but this particular shift would result in increased revenue if you categorized it differently. Another matter for interpretation, and this is one I'll spend a few moments on, relates to the 2009 and 2010 sessions and the actions that were taken by the executive following the 2009 session. Um, for the most part, at the time, the executive actions following the 2009 session were considered, uh, were viewed as on allotments. In, in 2009, as a matter of history, the legislature passed a series of spending cuts and tax increases to balance the shortfall at that time projected to be about $4.5 billion. The governor signed most of the budget bills that vetoed the tax bills. This left the budget unbalanced. The governor then used unallotment authority to further reduce spending to achieve balance. The unallotments were reductions to spending, but they were not enacted in the traditional sense. Displaying them as a cut is one option, or reduction to spending because the executive actions did in fact reduce spending. They could have been displayed as on allotments uh, because at the time that they occurred, that they were largely viewed that way. Um, instead, the analysis leaves the executive actions at that time unallocated to reflect the fact that the Supreme Court subsequently invalidated those executive actions. That left the budget technically unbalanced again. Then flash forward, uh, a few months into the February 2010 forecast, which at that point showed a $994 million shortfall. However, after the Supreme Court invalidated the governor's unallotment actions, the shortfall then expanded to $3.4 billion. The overall shortfall at that of 3.4 is shown in this analysis, um, but that higher number reflects many reductions that were previously made by the executive action. The analysis characterizes them largely as cuts and shifts in 2010, 
However, they had been internalized into the budgets in the previous summer through those executive actions. These actions in 2010 clarified the legal ambiguity by making the cuts and the shifts official. Still, it's important to note that this represents an interpretation in the analysis. And we have a few other examples, and then we'll move directly into the data. Um, another example of how to uh, characterize a budget choice is the health impact fee. At the time the provision was enacted, it was considered a fee. The attached analysis is, assumes it to be a fee because it was considered so at the time that it was enacted. However, its, res uh, its resources flow into the general fund by way of the health impact fund. This has been an ongoing discussion, uh, certainly in the Senate as we work through the exchange bill. Um, arguably, because of that dynamic, that, that, that law, it could also be considered a transfer. Mr. Marks already spoke about uh, how we categorize transfers. Um, under our budget rules, they're largely considered revenues. So too with reserves. Um, whenever revenues and transfers are booked, we typically consider them in a budget accounting uh, for building your state budgets as a, as a revenue source. But these are one-time resources, so they are not revenues in the traditional sense that tax <coughs> revenues are. <coughs> Similarly, K-12 shifts are one-time in nature. They reduce appropriations and, as I mentioned earlier, could be considered cuts, but they are both, all of these are one-time. Another important aspect in the attached analysis is what's being measured. The attached analysis includes all sessions since 2001. It sums the budgetary balance in each session's actions and arrives at a net negative balance since 2001 of $18 billion. This answers the question, how much has Minnesota, how has Minnesota responded to budget circumstances over the past 11 sessions? However, if the question that you asked were different, you would get a different answer. For example, if the question were, how have budget shortfalls been addressed when there was a shortfall over the past 10 years, it would be a different answer. Under this question, we would want to isolate just the years when we had a shortfall or a deficit. If that was done, the total of the shortfalls would be about 21.8 billion. This question would require excluding the years where there was a positive balance. We'd also want to exclude the solutions for those particular years as well. So I hope with these caveats, it helps you think through some of the numbers that are in front of you. There is an open interpretation to how you would categorize these buckets. So Mr. Chair, I'd like to turn to Mr. Marks to go through the actual data. Mr. Marks. Then if you, if you turn to the legal size page that has uh, all the numbers on it, um, the, uh, um, I'll, I'll start down on the lower part of the page where the actual numbers are. Uh, the, the upper part of the page uh, gives a bit more description for each of the columns. Uh, column one is just describing which, which session it is and then for what biennium the numbers are for. And uh, uh, it's, uh, there are oftentimes, uh, or there are three uh, different years for uh, various bienniums. If you look, for example, at the first three uh, rows across there, the 2001 session was considering the budget for fiscal years 2002 and 2003. And that year in column two, there was actually a balance of a billion and a half. Uh, the second line, 2002 for fiscal years 2002, 2003, that would be the second year of the biennium, was still considering the budget for the 2002, 2003 biennium. And in the 2002 session, there was a, a negative balance of two point, uh, almost 2.3 billion. And then to wrap up for the 2002-2003 biennium, in the 2003 session, there was actually a negative balance uh, of 356,000 for that year. That'd be, that'd be comparable to, if you were thinking about us right now, would be for the 2013 biennium, the bi or, the, or the year that's gonna end June 30th. So, so there are three sets of, or three lines basically for each biennium in here. Uh, column two defines what the budget problem was, and some of these are positive. Uh, as Mr. Nauman noted, uh, this particular analysis is summing up all of these. Uh, if the question was, what's the total of the years in which there were negative problems, the number would be different because we wouldn't add the, the positive ones in here. Uh, but you can see what the budget problems were in various years, and in some cases it, where it's a positive number, there was a balance, so some people wouldn't consider that a problem. Uh, perhaps the characterization isn't quite correct, but. The, 
Uh, and at the bottom of that second column, you can see that the net here is 18 billion of, uh, in, to the negative. As Mr. Nauman mentioned, if you, if you were only adding the negative ones, it would be a $21 billion negative number. So uh, already a place where you, there's room for interpretation. Um, column three is looking at reductions or cuts. Uh, and uh, the total in that column of 3.1 uh, billion. Uh, and as we've cautioned you already, there are more things that could be included in this column if they weren't included in other columns, for example. Uh, and as Mr. Nauman mentioned, if you look at column eight, which is the, uh, the federal stimulus money, the American Rehabilitation, uh, Revitalization Re Rehabilitation Act money, that 786 million that's in that column in 2009, uh, it could actually, the, the cut number in column three could be 786 million bigger because the effect was a reduction of general fund spending and uh, using federal spending instead. So, uh, and we're adding all these cautions here just to point out that there are any number of ways you can use these numbers uh, uh, and put them together and, and I'm sure that will, be, that will occur. But uh, uh, so, so the sum in column three is 3.1 billion. Columns four and five summarize revenue items and we've attempted to separate them into non-tax and tax items. Uh, and again, there are other things that could go into these columns, most notably the transfers, uh, column seven, if, you, if that was desired. Um, in column four, the non-tax revenue column, uh, and I should point out that a, a positive number here would be lowering uh, revenues. A negative number is increasing revenues. Uh, the, probably the one notable one here, which Mr. Nauman already mentioned uh, in 2005 for the 2006-2007 session, that uh, 608 million in that uh, in that particular box that includes uh, uh, roughly 400 million from the cigarette fee that was uh, that was included that year. So in the non-tax uh, column, column four, 1.27 billion. In the tax items, um, the uh, net number is 83 million. And I would just mention that uh, uh, this one uh, can be positive, can be negative. Oftentimes, this is dealing with tax conformity issues, as was the bill that we just dealt with uh, this, the, uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, there are some other issues besides tax conformity, but this is mostly tax conformity issues in, in the column five column, in the column five numbers, excuse me. Column six is shifts. Uh, most of the revenue in the six billion, six point one billion total here is the two education shifts, but also included in this number are some delays in payments for human services, payments to counties w when those were shifted from one fiscal year into the next. The June accelerated sales tax, which for the percentage of which has changed over the years, is included in this column. And then also in 2009 and 10, uh, some tax refunds were delayed, income, income corporate uh, or, I'm not sorry, not income, corporate and sales tax refunds were delayed and that's included in this column. And again, as, as Mr. Nauman mentioned, uh, obviously the education shifts would be in the spending or greater reductions in spending if they weren't here. The tax ones would be changes in revenue if they weren't in the shifts column. Uh, column seven is transfers. These would be transfers into the general fund from other funds. Uh, probably the most notable one here is 2003 for fiscal four and five. Uh, of that 1.394 billion number, a billion zero two nine of that was when the tobacco endowments, uh, the fund, money from the tobacco endowments was transferred into the general fund. Uh, and uh, again, as I've mentioned, all of these could also count as uh, revenues. And uh, I've already mentioned column eight, the federal stimulus money. Uh, that, uh, then column nine is the use of reserves, uh, budget reserve cash flow account here. Uh, just uh, note that in uh, 2003 the reserves were actually increased by 530 million as part of the overall budget deal. There was money put back in the reserves after it had been taken out. Uh, column 10 is bonds. This, uh, these are the uh, tobacco securitization bonds that were authorized in 2011. Uh, at 640 million was the estimate at, at the time. Um, column 11 is bonding for capital projects. Uh, 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 back in the late 1990s uh, when the state actually had a number of surpluses, uh, uh, there, uh, general fund cash, as it was called, general fund money was put into capital projects at that time. 
the $75 million in 2002 here was going back and bonding for some of those capital projects for which cash had been spent for. So uh, relatively unique at that time, and, and it, was, uh, it was bonding for projects that had already been authorized, not yet issued, but uh, that, uh, that, uh, and then getting the cash or the general fund money back. Column 12 is the on allotments, uh, and as Mr. Nauman mentioned, this column does not include the on allotments in 2009, which were later um, undone or voided and, and uh, enacted in law uh, in, an, in another manner. Uh, if that number was in, obviously this column would be a lot bigger because that was a, a somewhat above $2 billion in the on allotments there. That's not included here because uh, those numbers were included in 2010 when they were actually enacted as as cuts, shifts, or other things at that time. And then uh, column 13 is, uh, this is sort of the math. It's summing up what's in columns 3 through 12. And then the last column is just uh, uh, what's left over. And in, in a number of cases, this, these were actually budget balances after, the, uh, uh, after the, all the other actions were taken in those years. You can note the big neg negative number in 2009. Uh, that wasn't the negative number at the time because of the on allotments, but uh, 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 that's basically showing the, the amount of the on allotments uh, in that year that we didn't <laughs> count. So. So that, uh, oh, and, and I, I just should mention one other column, one other thing I forgot. In column nine in the last row, the 34 million there uh, for 2012, that wasn't money going into our regular budget reserves. That 34 million is the money that's in the Vikings, or that's estimated to be in the Vikings Stadium Reserve. Uh, so a separate reserve, but uh, I characterized it in that particular column. So, uh, and then uh, I just want to mention that. Uh, but between the last two columns, there are a series of footnotes which are, are shown on the additional page, and I'm not going to go through those. They provide a little bit of background in some cases as to uh, various things that uh, were happening within those specific years. So, um, with that, Mr. Chair, I can go to the graphs, or if there are questions right now. Um. Uh, Senator Bach. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Marks, the column 10, the $640 million in bonds. <laughs> It seems to me I recollect we actually sold more than that. There was a coverage issue, but so was our debt service actually on more than six hundred and forty million? What was the, the actual number of bonds we had to sell? Um, Mr. Chair Mr. and Marks. Senator Bach, uh, we sold more bonds than that. The six hundred and forty million was the the estimated general fund savings in the debt service fund. Uh, it's the amount of cash realized from the bonds. The actual bonding number, I. It seems to me 756 million. I'm not positive if that was it, but it's it's in that neighborhood. The the actual amount of bonds that were sold. To get 640 in uh, Mr. Chair, Representative or Senator Bach, that's correct. Thank you, uh, Representative Han or Senator Hans. Thank, thank you, me. Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Marks. A uh, couple of questions. One uh, in column six, the column you've labeled shifts. Uh, in particular, you've got two numbers, the lower two, you know, 2011, 2010, and then 2012, 2013. You're showing two numbers, but it seems to me that you're double counting that shift. Is that not correct? And so if that's the case, why would you show at the bottom a total of $6 million? It's really the same shift. Mr. Marks. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Hand, that, that's another issue that, uh, that is certainly open to interpretation. Uh, the, the, the question I was attempting to, to resolve here was uh, how we dealt with the budget problem at the beginning of the session. If uh, column two, <coughs> excuse me, in column two for that year, the budget problem at five billion zero twenty eight. Uh, when the budget problem was defined in the two thousand eleven session, that in, in part of that budget problem was a, a statutory requirement that the aid payment shift for K twelve education go back to ninety percent. So, uh, and if, if, if that wasn't there, I mean, and, and you're correct to point out we were not at 90% at that time. We were at 70%, I believe. But current law required the aid payment to go back to 90%. So that became part of the budget problem that the legislature faced in 2011 was to go back to 90%. And one of the first steps taken was to say we're not going back there. And in fact, the shift got increased from 70 to, or to 60% in the, in the end. Uh, but if, uh, if it's part of the budget problem, if it's part of the five million, we needed to solve the five million, and, and that was part of the solution. So, 
So, but you're correct to point out that uh, that essentially uh, is, is counting a solution that never really happened, but it did from the status of current law. It never really happened in, in effect at the school districts. But in order to make the numbers work, it needs to be in there, or otherwise the five million number needs the five billion number needs to be two billion lower as well. And Mr. Chair and, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Marks, I appreciate that. And the only caution that I'm raising here is that. Uh, documents like this, as they become public, someone I'm confident is going to step and say, hey, there's been $6 million in shifts, because it says so right here, and there's a document, and they'll refer to your document as proof. And uh, and so I, my, my point is that this is, I think, misleading, if, because that's the conclusion that people will draw. And and so I just want to make that clear that, that there is a problem here and how this number, and the, the second question that I have, and it's related to what you're in your explanation you referred to, and that goes back to column two. And uh, it doesn't say this anywhere in your explanations, but just to be clear, and maybe I'm wrong, but if I am, I'm sure you'll correct me. But column two, as I understand it, is a reflection of the difference between two things, a projection or a forecast of spending and a forecast of revenue. And so you have the start of every budget year or budget cycle, you have two forecasts that we compare. And we say, well, our forecasted spending is X and our forecasted revenue is Y, and X minus Y is a sum number, and it's this number. And there's lots of things that go into those forecasts. And there's lots of assumptions, and we debate those assumptions, and there are all kinds of judgments that are brought into that. But again, the point is these don't represent um, – negative numbers in the standpoint that we have overspent, or they don't represent uh, uh, a decline in spending, or they don't, uh, the, the point I'm trying to get at is when you show the numbers, the conclusion that a person would draw from this is that, gee, uh, we've, uh, you know, declined in spending by $18 million or something, or $18 billion, whatever it is. But it, it's not, it's not, uh, the, the point I'm trying to get at is, is how clear is this document how much clarity is this bringing to the debate that we're going to have? Or is it just going to be used as a political football for people to make political points? Well, and, and Mr. Marks, I don't, you can answer that if, if you want. I mean, I think the point of this exercise is, is, first of all, really not to make any particular political point, uh, but to recognize that what's happened uh, over the last 10 years, acknowledging that these are forecasts, is that is the solutions that we have gone to to solve for these budget forecasts, which is our constitutional responsibility. And what it demonstrates is that we've done, a lot of that has been done through things that are one-time solutions. <coughs> uh, and uh, borrowing from other funds to kind of cover up our general fund challenges. And, uh, and I think this, to that, to that extent, that's what this document is trying to represent and nothing, and nothing more. Uh, I'd also be very happy if everybody were acknowledged we were, we were only solving for less than a three billion prob billion dollar problem in 2011, uh, instead of a six, five or six billion dollar problem. Uh, I mean, if that's the way we want to define it, that's great, uh, but that's not how it's been defined. Uh, and so I, I, I do think that how this is, you know, it, for the purpose of this document, this is accurately defined. Um, Mr. Nauman or Mr. Marks? So, so, Mr. Chair, um, to, to one of Senator Hand's points that he sort of gl glanced over that I thought it's worth amplifying a little is that the column six displays when we buy back shifts. Or, or, I'm sorry, when we enact a shift. It doesn't display when we buy it back for the simple fact that the mechanism that's been used to buy back shifts over this period, and shifts have been bought back, as you know, is that it's built into the spending as a result of the forecast. So it actually gets internalized and accounted for in the accounting of column two. So it's already built into that. And that's a choice as well. Um, but we chose to use numbers in column two that members were more or less familiar with. But certainly the shifts is another interpretation how that got handled in the document. Mr. Martin. And Mr. Chair, and, uh, and just commenting further on Senator Han's comments, uh, you're absolutely correct in the sense that this is not, this is reflecting how the, for the most part, it's the February forecast uh, problem or surplus or so on was dealt with. It's not, uh, it's not comparing to the pre spending to the previous year, revenue to the previous year, or anything of those sorts. The, the, the issue here is taking 
taking that number from the February forecast and then defining how it got resolved. And, uh, and that's the same issue or the, 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 the same issue you were getting at with the 2011 situation with the shift is that the February forecast defined the problem as $5 billion and included uh, uh, it, and part of the creation of that problem was a law requiring the, aid, the education aid payment shift to go back to 90%. Uh, part of the solution was, no, we're going to stay at 70% and in fact, we're going to go to 60%. Uh, so an argument could be made that uh, Mr. Nauman tells me there's about 1.8 million of uh, uh, the difference between 70% and 90% there. Uh, could, one could argue that the 2.293 should be lower by 1.8, but then the 5 billion needs to be lower by 1.8 as well because we're, we're removing <laughs> 1.8 billion of the problem. So it's, it's a matter of uh, the definition and keeping everything parallel. And avoiding double counts. Senator, <laughs> you have further questions at this point? No, thank okay. you. Mr. Senator La or Representative Laughter. This is um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, this is an impressive summary of history. And, and you, know, you have to make choices, I understand. It's really hard. I'm just wondering if any of these columns, either the expenditures or the shift column, um, reflect decisions to transfer state financial responsibility for federal match to <laughs> local governments. I know that's been done in human services. I think it's been done in some transportation areas. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if that's included in either the expenditure or the shift columns, I may, or maybe it's too deep into the weeds. Mr. Mr. Chair and Representative Loeffler, uh, it would be included to the extent that that resulted in lower state general fund spending, so then it would be in the reductions in column three. Uh, it w it's. I didn't spend enough time doing enough analysis going into seeing if that sort of thing would happen and include or happened and included it in the shift column. It's, okay. it's simply reflected by lower spending. Thank you. Other questions? <coughs> Mr. Chair, members, then uh, fairly briefly, you have two graphs, a, uh, a bar graph uh, and a pie chart. They both use the information from the bottom line in the in the legal size piece of paper, and uh, and then uh, just attempt to quantify or just attempt to put in a graphic form that same information. Uh, the the pie chart has percentages on it. The bar graph has the numbers, the same numbers that are on the bottom line there, and uh, that's about all I need to say about those. And Mr. Chair, Senator Ham, and Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Marks, and I would just as uh, Senator Lori just pointed out, I would show your graph here and to the person uh, who looks at this and says, oh my gosh, how have we solved our budget problems over the last number of years? Well, we've been using shifts because we've had $6.1 billion of shifts, which is just not true. And I just would say that when we have numbers and graphs that show things that are not true, then I would say that they're wrong and we should correct them. Mr. Chair and Senator Han, I, uh, it's true as compared to the February forecast numbers. It's, right. it's what you want to measure against. All right. And, and, and I would also caution then that if, if those shifts aren't included in there, then the budget problem needs to be refined as, or redefined as well. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Baumtrot? <coughs> Welcome. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, good morning. Uh, my name is Ryan Bomtrog with Minnesota Management and Budget. And uh, before we get started on the presentation, wanted to highlight a couple other documents that are in your packet this morning. Uh, the first is the price of government report that we put up on our website. Um, it's our kind of public transparency, gives a little briefer on the price of government and what it means um, to citizens. Also included in there is the impact of the governor's budget on the price of government, so giving the details on the governor's budget and what that does to the price of government. And then finally, the last document that we've provided is um, comparing the governor's budget to the November forecast price of government to see how the governor's budget uh, impacts the price of government across state, uh, local, and uh, school district revenues. 
So I'm not going to spend a lot of time this morning uh, going over those documents, but just wanted to provide them for, for you for your reference. Can I just ask a quick question on that? So just at the top it says current year 2013, fiscal year 2014. What, what does that get? What does that mean? It's, uh, it's calendar year and fiscal year. So some of the revenues um, come in calendar year and some are fiscal year. And so the state and um, I believe the state and school districts are on a fiscal year, whereas uh, cities and counties are on a calendar year. So it's just we put them all into one column for comparative purposes, but wanted to recognize that some entities receive the revenues in a calendar year. So, if I, so, what is that? Say the calendar year 2013, fiscal year 2014. What is that showing exactly then? So that's showing which. It's so, <laughs> it's yeah. Sorry, it's it's a way to show the comparability, so that we're counting the revenues where they're collected and doing it for comparability, so that we're able to do the cross cut between schools, non-schools, and state revenues in the same comparison. So it's recognizing the revenues. Senator Lori. So I, I, that was confusing me too, and I had the same question. So let me try to rephrase what I think the answer was, is that some entities operate on a calendar year basis and some entities, and, and the state operates on a fiscal year basis. So for those entities that operate on a calendar year basis, you'll see the revenue uh, from calendar year two th 2013 in that first column and for the state that r recognizes um, expenditure, expenditures and revenues on a fiscal year, you'll see fiscal year 14 in that column. So that's the way they put them together. Is that is that an accurate reflection of the answer you gave? Mr. Chair, Senator, yes. So are you splitting the calendar year in half then to match up the, the years or not? No. Okay. No, we're not. All right. All right, thank you. Yeah, of course. So if it uh, works for the committee, what I'd like to do is provide an overview of the price of government report, um, provide a little bit of details of what it comprises and um, what it doesn't comprise, and then give a kind of an update of the price of government as it stands currently with the November forecast and then also um, with the governor's budget, basically. So the price of government, it started in 1994 under Governor Carlson. It, uh, we have revenues going back to 1991, and we have a slide later in the deck that shows uh, the price of government calculation from 1991 um, through the forecast. The price of government is uh, the state's main uh, transparency method for showing the cost of state and local government. <coughs> and it's defined as total state and local revenues divided by total Minnesota personal income. So it reflects how much each dollar earned in Minnesota goes to support state and local governments. So it's really the state's main transparency tool for showing revenues at all levels of government. When we release a general fund forecast, what we're looking at there is just general fund revenues. And what the price of government does is it shows revenues across all governments, state, local, including cities and school. So it's our main state local finance transparency metric that we have for the state. <laughs> so the price of government, it compares. Uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Representative Carlson. Yeah, just a, a quick question. When you say all revenue, I, uh, just to clarify uh, what I'm going to call voluntary expenses, uh, do you include then um, various events, athletic events, um, dormitory fees, tuition income, those kinds, of, all of that is included? Yes, yes. On, um, actually, to look and see what's included, it might be most helpful to look at um, the second page here. It is a very, we include almost all revenues, including um, fees of localities, revenues. In fact, actually, the next, the next slide talks about everything that is included in the price of government and own source revenues. And so it does include, um, for state revenues, it includes U of M and Minsky tuition estimates. Um, it includes for uh, localities um, any fees that they charge for special events, licenses, charges for services. So it does include all of those different revenues. It, it doesn't exclude many. OK, thank you. So the price of government, again, it breaks out revenue by type. 
uh, providing information on income, sales, property, other taxes, as well as fees and other <coughs> non-tax revenues raised by the state and local governments. And the share, uh, it also provides the share of revenues of where they're collected in the state. And we uh, provide updates on the price of government, both with the forecasts um, in November and February, end of session, and then we also update for the governor's budget. At this time, it might, it might behoove uh, me to admit that there is a slight rounding error on this slide. It is uh, Minnesota Statutes 16A.102 that requires uh, Minnesota Management and Budget to prepare this report, and I know somebody <laughs> may would, uh, would probably ask that later on. So breaking down the price of government components, what we call own source revenues, those collected directly by the states or local units, those include taxes, non-tax revenues, and non-tax revenues. And non-tax revenues comprise uh, licenses and permits, charges for services, investment earnings, special assessments, and uh, also tuition for Minsk U and U of M. Intergovernmental revenues um, are state aids, local aids, and also federal grants that both the state and localities receive. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the price of government excludes a few things, including uh, enterprise revenues from local utilities and liquor stores and some pension revenues as well. Mr. Senator, uh, thank you. Uh, and just a question, where does, do, do uh, things like lottery revenues show up? Lottery revenues would show up under the state. Under the state, okay. Mr. Baumtruck. So again, uh, the price of government looks at total revenues and compares it to Minnesota personal income. And personal income is the broadest real-time measure that the state has for, me for measuring Minnesota's economic activity. And so the personal income measures uh, and includes <laughs> wage and salary, business income, interest and dividends, and transfer payments. So it is a really broad swath of what we consider revenue or personal income, apologize. It's uh, personal income is estimated by the Bureau of Economic Analysis at the U.S. Department of Commerce and then MMB projects, um, projects uh, for Minnesota personal income using economic or econometric models based on the information they get from the federal government. Senator Pappas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Baumtrog. I noticed you say you're excluding pension revenues. Are you also excluding then pension expenses? Pensions are totally excluded. Yeah, again, um, well, that's, a, that's a good point to make is that we're looking at revenues here. Mm -hmm. So the price of government is really focusing on revenues and not on the expenditure side. Okay. So to give a little status update of uh, the price of government, um, in fiscal year 13, uh, about 15.6 cents of every dollar will go for state and local services. Total own source resources or revenues for fiscal year 13 will reach about $38 billion, while our personal income will exceed $248 billion. One thing that's, that's interesting to look at about the price of government is who collects the revenue. So the state collects 61% of the total revenue in the state whereas cities, counties, towns, and special districts collect 31% and school districts raise about 8%. Another way to think about this is those are the entities that raise the money, but then you can also include um, a discussion about then who receives that money or where that money is, is allocated. And so this, these pie charts here provide a picture of all of the different revenues, which includes federal grants, which includes intergovernmental aids, and provides a picture of, for the state, um, local non-school and schools, the main source of their revenues. And I think the biggest impact that this has is if you look at schools, over 70% of their income comes from, or revenue comes from intergovernmental aids. So there's, there's one way to look at the price of government about who is raising the revenues, but then also to look at where those revenues go. And so that, that is what we found is to be helpful when looking at the price of government is not only who's raising them, but where they go.
As I mentioned earlier, we have historical data going back to so, 1991. I'm sorry. So just to clarify, I, you might have said this. I was distracted for a minute. So you back out those intergovernmental governmental aids that when you okay. That's right. where the numbers do. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So when we come up with our calculation, we just do the what we call own source. So the revenues that they, you know, the entities receive, not ones that are shared in between. Correct. <coughs> so this slide provides, and I apologize for the size of it, but wanted to provide the complete history of our records dating back to 1991 for the price of government. And as you can see, it fluctuates from year to year, and it fluctuates for uh, any number of reasons. It can fluctuate uh, because of law changes that change uh, revenues raised by the state or local units of government, but it can also change based on forecasts. So as forecasts come up in November and February, it can change revenues at all entities of government and could impact also personal income, what we're forecasting for that. And so the main point is just to mention that, that there is some, some fluctuation that occurs between the price of government just as forecasts come, come in with new revenue estimates and new estimates for Minnesota personal income. This next slide kind of dives into that a little bit just to show how sensitive the price of government is to projected revenue and personal income forecasts. So what this looks at is the a breakdown of state and local uh, own source revenues and the change from year to year against the change that we saw in Minnesota personal income. And so you can see from year to year that while revenues may be increasing, it could be that personal income doesn't increase at the same level. So there is fluctuation and change in the price of government just in the forecast that we do. I think one, one to circle in on is uh, fiscal year 2009. The price of government was 14.7%. If you look at what happened in, in fiscal year nine, the state and local own source revenues, the percent change from year to year was 1.9%, a negative 1.9%, while Minnesota personal income grew 5.2%. And so what the result of that is that the, personal, or the price of government went down pretty significantly for, for fiscal year 2009. So, Mr. So this is show, I mean, kind of taking aside those forecasts for the next um, fiscal years, which all show that the growth in revenues is growing less than personal income for all four of those years in the forecast. In six out of the ten previous years, the price of government grew actually at a slower rate than personal income did in the state. Mr. Chair, yes, I believe that's correct. Now, if there aren't any other questions about some background, what I want to do is just quickly highlight uh, <clears throat> revenues as a percent of personal income and, and where they're going with this forecast. And so the forecast for uh, fiscal year 13, we're showing uh, overall total own source revenues are expected to grow about 4% between fiscal years 13 and fiscal years 15. Meanwhile, Minnesota personal income is expected to grow 7.9% between fiscal year 13 and 15. And so that's pushing uh, a decline in the, in the price of government by seven tenths from, or six tenths from 15.6% to 15%. What this table also highlights is the breakdown between tax revenues and non-tax revenues. So in fiscal year 13, of the 15.6 percent, 11 point or 11, yeah, 11.1 percent is coming from tax revenues, while 4.4 percent is coming from non-tax revenues. And so the price of government can be used to look at of the revenues that the state and localities are raising, how much of that is coming from tax revenues, and how much is coming from other fees or other things that have been enacted by the legislature or localities. Finally, what I just wanted to hit upon is um, the governor's budget. Revenues are expected to uh, increase under the governor's budget, and percent, the Minnesota percent of uh, price of government, excuse me, will rise seven tenths of a percent from 15 percent 
to 15.7 percent. And so this is one, one metric in which to look at the governor's budget and other proposals that will come through the legislature about um, the impact on the price of government and the, the percent of personal income and how that is impacted. Questions that people have. Uh, Representative Lincheski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Excuse me, I kind of have a cough. Um, can you tell me? I know you said in the beginning, um, Mr. Is it Bomb Truck? Yeah, Bomb Truck. Um, you said you'd attempt to back out the federal money in making these calculations. But can you walk me through how the fact that the payroll tax benefit federally? Um, how is, how is that playing out now? So folks are losing that benefit. So people are pay, just paying more in taxes because of an act of Congress, at least on that piece. How does that build into what we're looking at here? Now again, so this is looking at just state, school, and locality. So it's not including federal taxes. And I think that's a, a good point to, to include is that this doesn't include um, taxes paid or revenues collected um, from the federal government. So this is just state and localities and not federal government. Mr. Chair, and so does that drill down to, you know, while it's, I'm aware it's not the federal tax per se, it changes people's federal liability for state tax purposes. So it's just internalized into the number as to what people project people's revenue will be? You know, one thing um, in thinking about, oh, yeah. That question is a good question, Representative. Um, one thing that I, I do know that I can answer is that if we were to include information about the federal government, about 20 cents of, if we were to do this for the federal government, it would be about 20 cents of every dollar would go for federal services. And, and in the past couple years, that's been slightly down around 18% because of that payroll tax cut. So if we were to look at it from the federal perspective, it went from about 20 cents down to 18 because of the federal tax cut. And Mr. Chair? Representative Lecheski. Well, and I think that highlights that, you know, there was a rosier view of income maybe as a result of that benefit and a more negative view from the state perspective now as due to the loss of that benefit. So I appreciate you um, just spending a little time with me on that for a minute. So thank you. So, have you ever, I mean, it, I mean, I guess it, it's reflected in the actual price of the government because it's the ratio, but, you know, as I just total these up numerically, the percent changes, and I know they build on top of one another if you're going to do it actually, but we have about a close to a 59% growth in personal income if you just add, you know, and again, that's not the, there's no multiplier effect built into that because that's beyond me right now versus a 48% percent growth, you know, increase in the change in the in in state and local taxes. So personal income again is actually growing more quickly than state and local taxes are, and then that's reflected in why the numbers are going down. Again, uh, Mr. Chair, you're you're correct. The the price of government will change. So with forecasts in personal income and revenue. So to the extent that personal income has been growing at a faster rate than revenues, you would see um, the price of government go down. Other questions that people have? Mr. Sure. Uh, Mr. Uh, is it bomb truck? Yes, yeah, correct. Um, thank you. Um, just just thinking about this price of government thing, uh, and and uh, you at least seem to be in the in the analytic world here. Um, what uh, what should all this tell me? What, what value is all this that, uh, as as a legislature, uh, legislator rather, what uh, how sh how should I use this? How should I think about it? What does it tell me, Mr. Bontra, Mr. Chair, Senator? Um, you know that's a very good very good question, and you're right. I do come from the land of analysis, and in the land of analysis, this is a very powerful powerful document in terms of looking at it, at it from a statewide perspective and looking at how legislation that you may enact 
or changes at the local government, how that affects the state as a whole. And so as you go forward through this session in terms of making decisions of um, revenue changes, <laughs> to, to see or to think about how that impacts all local units of the government, to look at the statewide perspective and have a metric to look at that can be a helpful, a helpful way to, to use as you guys make your decisions. Mr. Chair, members. And just for me, I honestly think I could understand this a lot better if it was uh, uh, the price of government based on numbers of people, or w which would, I think, imply services rendered. It's just difficult for me to equate uh, the price of government based on on the vast array of incomes that come into the state of Minnesota and 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 and, and churn within the state of Minnesota that may have nothing to do with services. And that's what that's my that's what I'm pondering, and I don't have an answer. And maybe along the way, somebody can help me. He could pass the law. You know, do it that way. <laughs> uh, Representative Carl, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I I want to go back to my uh, earlier question. I should have noticed the tuition post secondary was on the list, but what I had dropped down to look at was uh, enterprise revenues. And maybe I'll ask a little different question. Uh, how do you determine what is enterprise revenue versus um, other sources of revenue? Because you exclude that. And the list that I that just came to mind that I read off, um, I would categorize as enterprise revenue, but apparently it's not. So how is that decision made? Is that prescriptive in the law, or is that a decision that um, the department makes as part of their analysis? It's. Uh Mr. Chair, Representative, it's not prescriptive in law. Um, what, when this got established, part of the process was to go through all of the different revenues that could be included and to do a judgment of what should be included or what should not be included. And when it comes to enterprise revenues, uh, many other states, more than Minnesota, have um, local utilities, liquor stores that, that could be included in the analysis, but for our case, has not been, and it's been that been consistent throughout that we have not included those revenues. And the, if if you would like, there is a we could provide a list of everything that is included. In general, m mostly everything is included in our in our own source revenues. Yeah, and Mr. Chairman, I, the only reason I asked that question, I when we talk about enterprise revenues or what I referred to as earlier as certain voluntary type expenses, I think it kind of inflates the perception of the cost of government. Now, I have no idea what those totals would be, other than that there are some fairly uh, large enterprises, if you will, that people engage in on a voluntary basis that uh, government uh, maybe provides uh, indirectly. You know, uh, there's huge revenue comes in on dormitory fees. Now, I, I would call that enterprise. If a state university builds a dormitory, those are revenue bonds. They collect rent. Um, I'm not sure that's the same definition, at least in my mind, of, of a price of government as opposed to um, other activities. But um, I'll leave it at that. I, I was just more curious of how you determined what was enterprise. <coughs> Thank you. Representative Chesney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to Senator Senjum, you know, it's interesting you bring that up. You know, what, what does this tell you? And, you know, I think there's pluses and minus of, minuses of looking at this um, information. I'll tell you what I think about the price of government. This is how I remember it. Um, it started before I was on my city council. And I remember when I was a Bloomington city council member, we would look at it to get a sense of, in totality, what are ever, what is everyone else doing to our constituents? So we were running a city, but we wanted to see what was the county of Hennepin doing, what was our school district doing, what were legislators doing to burden our taxpayers? You know, what was the percentage burden? I guess kind of. And the way I remember we used to look at it is we would take this this sheet and we just look across the bottom, and that would sort of say, you know, what is a what is a percentage is going on here, and you know, if, if it was fairly high, you'd feel a little reticent to raise some more taxes, even if you personally weren't um, maybe spending too much as a city council member, you could see maybe overall things are trending in a way that's difficult for people. Um, 
but I always thought, you know, you can, if income's growing really fast, you can sort of ride the income growth wave and, and do more spending and not harm people as much because people are feeling, you know, wealthier, or, or not feeling, they are wealthier. And so if you were significantly conservative in your principles, you might say, well, I'm not going to do that. You know, people are just better off right now. I'm still not going to spend more. But it at least gave you a measure of where are people uh, re in relating their income to their tax burden. And I think there's some, you know, legitimate criticisms I think both sides could have about this measure. But my memory of it and I stand to be corrected by Senator Bach or Representative Carlson, is it was the Minnesota Chambers Initiative. And I think it was carried by partisanly. I don't know who the authors were, but it was really sort of trying to get at, you know, you've got tuition and you've got the Metropolitan Council and the Mosquito Control District and the legislature and your county and, you know, all these things are going on. How can we, with one number, just sort of balance off burden against um, income? And, and I think there's a lot of critiquing you can do, but that's how I recall the point of this initiative. And, and maybe Mr. Bomtrog can tell us, but I remember at the time I, when I, it had only been in place a few years when I started, and it was a very big, um, it, was, it was really pushed by the chamber locally mm -hmm. for me, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and I was on our chamber board at the time that this is how legislators and decision makers and locally elected officials should look at government spending, and, and I think it's, you know, it's just, I, I'm not trying to be for it or against it, it's just that was how I used it and that's how I think about it, and, and I don't know that we've changed anything about it since the law was passed. I mean, I, maybe someone in this room can tell us if a single word's been changed about this law, I don't know. But that, that's just how I remember thinking about it um, when I first heard of it. Resident Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, my, my comment also is in follow-up to Representative Sunjim's question and comment. Um, and uh, I, so this is obviously one measure, and we have lots of data off which to work as we move forward in the legislature and, and work to balance the budget, but um, it does reflect the relationship between um, the what the revenue that we're taking in a personal income, which is a data point I think we should consider. And I've never been the biggest fan of talking about our work and using the measure of size. Um, sometimes people like to argue the size of government, whether it's too big or too small. It's never been my favorite measure because it's cr a fairly crude measure, I think. But if we were to apply what we're looking at here um, and using a size argument, it looks like our trend has been pretty steady, although maybe just a little down, when we think about the relationship between revenue and personal income. But your point about um, services, right, which we're not really looking at here, I think triggers for me a question about demographics and the demographics of our state of an aging population, a growing population, um, but a, a population that's retiring and that's going to impact or could impact some people's personal income. Um, and so while I think this is an important data point in the stuff that we were talking about before, uh, Mr. Marks and Mr. Nowen, um, it does help me sort of think through or makes me think through what our work is doing in terms of the lives of Minnesotans um, and the work that we have to do ahead. And, and so I know that we're just looking at data right now, but it's, it's not hard for me to at least draw the conclusion that uh, we have been um, We've been adding burdens, right, to middle class families. And you can see it in these documents. Um, and when you talk about the services and demographics, that's what that triggers for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm grateful for the data that we've got here, because I think that's going to inform our decision making going forward. Um, and I guess I'll just leave it at that. Thanks. Mr. Senator Sanjum. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, and Mr. Baumgart, I just have a, I have a question. Uh, if uh, if our if our national and international corporations do better, you know, Hormel, General Mills, 3M, Cargill, uh, even Mayo serves many people outside of the state of Minnesota. If, if they all do better, even though all their money doesn't stay in Minnesota, but that makes that makes for a larger denominator, right? And 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 thus, the better they do corporately, nationally and internationally, the bigger that number gets and, and the smaller than the price of government probably. Is that a safe presumption? 
Mr. Depending Chair, on how fast government Mr. Grows. Chair, Senator, um, it, it, it all depends on the change in revenues and personal income. So right. I think what you're saying is that if personal income grows, what does that do to the price of government? And it would decrease the price of government, depending on the overall change in revenues. Thanks, Senator Pat. Just a comment and maybe a question or clarification, if I'm interpreting this correctly. Um, that it shouldn't matter a whole lot whether we use um, spending or revenue as our comparison to personal income if you assume that we have to have a balanced budget and that nobody is carrying really huge reserves. Is that an accurate um, interpretation, Mr. Baumtrag? Mr. Chair, Senator, I'm not quite sure I understand um, what you're getting at. I mean, in terms of you know, this this is again just looking at revenues and right. not and not the spending side. So, right. uh, just but, but what I just said, Mr. Chairman, is that well, since we have to have a balanced budget, well, unless we do school shifts, for instance, <laughs> right? I mean, that would if we do show higher shifts, revenue and less. It would show <laughs> higher revenue. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, Senator Ham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I actually have a question that uh, maybe could be answered by Mr. Marks or Mr. Nauman, but. And I want to go back to the original document that we talked about, the longer sheet that, and it's a, uh, I think, uh, focused on the general fund, which is appropriate, I think, because most of what we do is we work on general fund uh, legislation. However, uh, I am curious, and I guess I would like to find if there's perhaps some presentation that could be made to this committee. What has been the change over perhaps the same period of time in the amount of federal dollars that our state has taken in to help us uh, in our budget? And I'm thinking more particularly, but not exclusively, of the increase in federal dollars that we're using in the health and human services world and the dependency that our state is, is assuming to cover costs that we want to provide to people of this state by using federal dollars. And just somehow I think that that should be recognized as we talk about our budget and if we are especially, as it seems to be we're attempting to do, is shift more and more of the burden of things that we do at the state to things that are going to be paid for by the federal government, we ought to understand what the extent of that liability is and what the change of that liability has been over time. So does that mean we're done? <laughs> I don't know. I uh, but, so I, I guess I just would like to ask if, if there could be some. that point, Senator Hayes, and actually to uh, Senator Sendrum's point as well, uh, both of those topics will uh, are going to be subjects of kind of the future meetings we have planned to look at our taxes on a per cap and spending on a per capita basis and see how that relates and related to inflation and things like that, and then to address the federal fund. So that is in the uh, in the plans. And if people have other lenses that they think would be helpful to look at stuff, why don't you just let uh, me know. So, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, and with that, uh, we are adjourned.